just a couple of quick uh, messages and reminders for everybody um, on our website. And I think um, uh, Kristen Eicher will put this in the chat. Um, we have now published all four of the NOFOs or research solicitations for the FY 2024 cycle. Um, so please visit the website. Uh, we do have a new announcement this year, as we have been talking about, and those are K uh, grants, which um, provide support for uh, early career um, uh, researchers. The other um, issue that I want to uh, bring up and draw your attention to is that also on the website, uh, on the dashboard, our funding dashboard, um, you can go and see now all 12 of the FY23 um, research um, projects which were funded. All of these were high impact, um, excellent projects. Um, also on the dashboard are the links to the abstracts describing each of those projects um, for you as well. Um, and with that, I wanted to say we're delighted to have Dr. Verma and his team back presenting their work and I turn it over uh, to Dr. Anderson. Thanks, Dr. Kubali. Yep, I echo exactly what you just said. We're really excited for this presentation today. Um, Dr. Amit Verma is a professor of medicine and oncology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the director of the Division of Hematology Oncology at Montefiore Medical Center. He completed his internal medicine residency, followed by a fellowship in hematology oncology at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and then went on to a second fellowship in transplant medicine at Northwestern University. In 2012, he was named a scholar in clinical research by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Dr. Verma is a very active clinical and laboratory researcher invested in the better understanding of the pathogenesis and the treatment options for myeloid malignancies and leukemias, discovering and highlighting potential therapeutic targets of specific activation pathways for diseases such as myelodysplastic syndrome and AML. His investigations are funded by numerous prestigious organizations, including the American Cancer Society and the Department of Defense. For the World Trade Center Health Program research, he has been involved in the establishment of a repository of blood and serum samples of exposed and non-exposed patients that have the potential to inform and modernize diagnostic capabilities for these malignancies. Very applicable to the program. We're really excited for your presentation, Dr. Verma. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Kubali. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to talk to this audience. Um, we've been trying to work with samples uh, that were collected from first responders. And uh, this is a huge collaborative project uh, that wouldn't be possible without uh, the team uh, enabled by Dr. David Prezant, Dr. Rachel Ligovans, and the whole team uh, at, at uh, FDNY and at Einstein Montefiore. So I present on their behalf. So, uh, the, the aim of this project was to detect early signs of blood cancers in the first responders. And this project started um, many years ago when Dr. Prezant and his team had noticed that they were the first responders were exhibiting signs of early malignancies. This was a paper in Lancet, which also showed a signal of increased numbers of cases of myeloma. Uh, another blood cancer. And so we started uh, working on this project. The, the genesis, the hypothesis is that the exposure to the World Trade Center dust, particulate matter, was quite toxic. And I, I, I don't need to tell this audience that there was a large amount of dust and smoke that was in ground zero, and uh, it was covering lower Manhattan. There have been a lot of analyses done, which shows there's a bunch of harmful chemicals that was present in the particulate matter, including polycyclic hydrocarbons, phenols, dioxins, burn jet fuel, asbestos. And all of these were being inhaled uh, by first responders. So with the help of a grant from the Valvano Foundation that uh, Dr. Prezant obtained, we started collecting samples from active and retired firefighters and EMS workers 
who were exposed to the, the World Trade Center disaster. And we have now uh, in our biorepository around 3,000 samples uh, that have been collected and preserved. To, to look at these effects, we needed a good control group. And um, the control group that we acquired was collected uh, from primarily two sources. One was uh, IAFF convention, you know, a convention of firefighters that was in Washington, D.C. We collected a uh, few samples after consenting. And we also obtained samples from firefighters in the Nashville, Tennessee area from our collaborator, Dr. Savona, who's a professor in Vanderbilt University. So we had a total of 255 controls. So the biobank uh, that has been created uh, contains blood samples primarily. Uh, we have also separated sera from uh, a good proportion of these samples. And for a few of them, we were able to obtain uh, cheek swaps for germline DNA also. The first study that we embarked upon was in collaboration with Ola Landgren, uh, who is a world famous myeloma expert at Sloan Kettering. And the idea was to use serum samples obtained from first responders to look for early signs of the blood cancer multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma uh, is preceded by a precancerous state called MGUS, which is known as monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance. And this can be detected by a test called serum electrophoresis, where we basically look for a monoclonal peak uh, in a particular immunoglobulin. So we did that, and these results have been published already. I'm sure you have heard about this uh, before, so I'll, I'll not spend too much time on this. But basically, uh, from an analysis of 781 FDNY first responders, we detected um, this condition, MGUS, the myeloma precursor, in 6%. And when you compare it with a control population, we found that the, the odds of obtaining uh, for a diagnosis of MGUS was about twofold higher in the first responders after correction for age. Uh, the reason for the correction for age, you can see in these dot blots that the FDNY first responders were found to develop this condition 10 years earlier than when it peaks. So the median was 10 years and earlier. So this, this finding was then validated in, in a follow-up study, which was also supervised by Dr. Prezant and Dr. Z. Governs, along with the, the whole team at FDNY. And this included general responders and FDNY uh, uh, subjects and saw the same thing, that there was a twofold higher risk of MGUS when compared to a general population. And the, the follow-up has been that these participants that had a positive test uh, are being contacted, some of them being contacted, and now being monitored in various hospitals close by. So, Another question that arises from these studies is, we can detect early signs of myeloma. What does it really mean? And this is a very important question, and I think this can be answered uh, by many studies that have looked at this and show that when you diagnose this blood cancer myeloma early, you have the opportunity to limit complications such as bone disease, pathological fractures caused by weakening bones, bad kidney injury that may be irreversible, severe infections, which may be life-threatening. So once we know that a patient has, a uh, subject has MGUS, these subjects are followed yearly with a blood test. And when hematologists see an uh, increase in their blood levels, uh, they can um, follow them aggressively, 
and detect early signs of myeloma. And we have a lot of new therapies now for myeloma, including cell therapies and transplant, whose success also depends on how early we diagnose this. You know, if you detect a, a case with late stage myeloma, with kidney damage, with heart damage, then the success of these therapies is much, much less. So catching cancer early always allows for more treatment options and increases the success rate of, of these therapeutic interventions. More recently, we have now started looking at a condition called clonal hematopoiesis, which is the main topic of my talk. So what is this thing called clonal hematopoiesis? So as we age, if you look at our blood cells and you start sequencing them, you will find that as we age, we acquire mutations in our blood cells and in blood stem cells. And these are somatic mutations, meaning that these are the mutations that arise after we are born. These are not germline. You're, we're not born with these mutations. And this condition, clonal hematopoiesis, is also known by some other names, uh, including a condition called CHIP or ARCH. And, but but the, the more correct term that is more prevalent nowadays is clonal hematopoiesis. And why is this important? This is a very important question because finding mutations in blood cells is associated with an increased risk of developing blood cancers. And the two blood cancers that have been most associated with uh, clonal hematopoiesis is acute myeloid leukemia or AML or myeloid dysplastic syndromes or MDS. These are diseases uh, that do carry a bad prognosis. And um, it's been shown in various studies, large cohorts, that clonal hematopoiesis increasing the risk of developing these malignancies almost tenfold. Fortunately, the number of people with clonal hematopoiesis that actually develop these malignancies is not that high. So what else can go wrong? Now there have been huge studies with, with huge cohorts like the, the Framingham cohort from the Boston, New England area and the UK Biobank um, in, in England, which show that when subjects have mutations in their blood, when they have clonal hematopoiesis, they have an increased risk of atherosclerotic heart disease. They also have an increased risk of various inflammatory diseases that can include liver diseases and can also include COPD, asthma, and other lung diseases. So, so the concept is that you have mutations in the blood cells, mutations in the white cells, and they cause more inflammation. They make the white cells, the macrophages, the monocytes more active, more inflamed. And so you have an increased risk of all of these systemic diseases. So just to summarize, this condition called clonal hematopoiesis increases with age. Uh, there are three genes that have been found to be mainly affected, a gene called TED2, DNA MT3A and a gene called ASXL1. These are the three major variants. And as I mentioned, there is an increased risk of evolving to a blood cancer, AML or MDS. The hazard ratio is 11, which is very high. But more prevalent is the increased risk of coronary artery disease, stroke. And um, as a couple of New England Journal papers have shown, there is increased all-cause mortality seen with clonal hematopoiesis. So what I want to emphasize is that this is a condition which is uh, rapidly gaining in importance, and we, we need to pay attention when people are diagnosed with clonal hematopoiesis. So uh, a few more words about cardiovascular disease, because um, you know elegant work from various groups have shown that there is an increased prevalence of cardiovascular disease in the first responder cohorts. And when you, when you look at the risk of cardiovascular disease in, in subjects with CH, they have increased coronary heart disease, they have ischemic stroke, early onset MI is more, and also uh, the, the reason has been elucidated. The, the thinking is 
that when you have a blockade in your coronary arteries, when you have clonal hematopoiesis, when you have mutant macrophages, mutant monocytes, they make the plaque, the atherosclerotic plaque, more unstable. So you have an increased risk because of the inflammation. Okay, so this is, this is what I'm trying to say. You, you have a mutation in the stem cells, which leads to mutations in the blood cells. Uh, these, these mutations are present in the monocytes and the macrophages. They cause increased expression of various inflammatory cytokines, and they lead uh, in atherosclerosis and unstable plaques. There is also uh, increased association of clonal hematopoiesis with all kinds of cancers. So the, the connection with acute myeloid leukemia is relatively straightforward because this is a pre-malignant disease which gives rise to MDS, which gives rise to AML. But studies have shown that clonal hematopoiesis may also be more prevalent in patients treated for solid tumors. And in fact, when you sequence the blood from patients with solid tumors, a good proportion of them do have uh, uh, clonal hematopoiesis, especially in important genes such as P53. And this is increasingly seen when they have, uh, uh, when they're elderly, when they've received prior chemo and radiation, as well as smoking. Smoking is actually very strongly associated with clonal hematopoiesis. Also, I mentioned inflammation. There is now studies coming out that clonal hematopoiesis may be associated with autoimmune disease. So this is an important topic to study. So what we did in our study was we used blood samples uh, from our biorepository and we subjected them to deep sequencing for a panel of 250 genes that are found to be mutated in clonal hematopoiesis. And um, what we found from these studies that were published last year in Nature Medicine was that the World Trade Center exposed first responders had an increased relative risk odds of clonal hematopoiesis mutations. In fact, the odds ratio was 3.14. This was statistically significant. And we also found that mice, which we exposed to the World Trade Center dust, also developed genomic instability, and I'm going to show you some of this data. So this is our, our top line findings that were published in uh, a paper last year. Uh, the, the curve, the line at the top, shows the rate of mutations in the World Trade Center first responders. And the lower line is the rate of mutations as seen in uh, firefighter controls, they were not exposed to WTC. And as you can see, the rate of mutations goes up as we age. And, and was also this phenomenon was also seen in the WTC exposed individuals, but there is a big difference between the frequency between the controls and the WTC exposed firefighters. This was a result of sequencing 481 first responders and 255 controls. And um, you know, because of the funding provided by the, the WTC program, CDC, NIOSH, it has enabled us to now sequence a larger cohort. We are in the process of getting that data analyzed right now, but, but we expect uh, to be able to show you results of sequencing analysis of almost 1,000 first responders uh, pretty soon, maybe in the next few months. Now that we see these mutations, the next question is, what genes are actually mutated? So the genes that we saw that were mutated were quite typical in our first analysis. They, uh, the largest uh, affected gene, the highest affected gene was DNMT3A, followed by this gene called TED2, an epigenetic regulator, splicing genes, P53, RAS, they're pretty, pretty uh, strong oncogenes here, including P53 and RAS. And um, the mutations were all different kinds, you know, missense mutations, nonsense mutations, but these were all real bona fide mutations. Uh, one word about sequencing, uh, we sequenced with a CLIA certified lab that actually performs clinical sequencing and a very high depth. So the sequencing quality of all our analysis was very high quality. 
And these were clinical grade reports that were generated for each case. What about the, the number of blood cells that actually have a mutation? So this is a term known as variant allele frequency. This is the number of mutations, uh, percentage of number of mutations in the blood. So you can see that about median of 12%. So about when you, when you look at the DNA from whole blood, 12% of the reads were mutated. So it's relatively low frequency, but it's there in the blood. And then I've talked about the quality of mutations, and these are the actual nucleotide changes that were seen in the, in the mutations. We performed uh, some basic science studies in the lab, and these were done in combination with a very talented basic scientist who studies DNA repair, Dr. Advaita Madhi Reddy, who's now assistant professor in Rutgers. We took blood cells, lymphocytes, and exposed them to a little sample of the vertebrate center dust. And what we saw was that exposure to the dust caused massive disruptions in DNA replication. And these white boxes show that the DNA replication was interrupted, was paused. And we also saw, when we looked at the mutations in the first responders and looked at their signatures, the signatures that were the most prevalent was aging, DNA repair, and smoking. So something was going on in, in the genome of these individuals that disrupted DNA repair and also caused errors in DNA replication, which could have led to acquiring more stress and more mutations. Then we proceeded to see if we could model these phenomena in a mouse model to, to establish causality, you know, cause and effect. So in the first set of experiments, we treated wild type mice, just normal mice, with either a placebo or one dose of World Trade Center particulate matter. Uh, thanks to Dr. Anna Nolan in NYU, who uh, graciously gave us a sample of the dust um, that was actually collected in the first three days of, of uh, the 9-11 disaster. So we sacrificed the mice a month after exposure and uh, sequenced their stem cells. And we found that there was an increased incidence of genomic deletions, indels, as well as mutations in the World Trade Center dust exposed mice compared to placebo. So just one exposure, which actually mimics an eight hour shift of a first responder at the site, uh, caused all of these massive changes in the genome. Since then, more recently, and these are unpublished results, uh, a very talented scientist who's on the call, uh, Dr. Divij Verma, has modeled uh, the exposure to World Trade Center dust in further set of mouse experiments. So we have now used the World Trade Center dust uh, and given it intratracheally to mice. And we have looked at what's happening at the stem cell level after exposure to this dust. So what we found was that the numbers overall of the stem cells and these various progenitors that give rise to blood show trends towards changes, but none of the changes is statistically significant. But what we find is that these stem cells after exposure are functionally deficient. And the way David showed that is a series of very elegant experiments. So he took mice, that were either exposed to placebo vehicle or World Trade Center dust, and then also took mice, which had a different marker on their stem cells, CD45.1. And these mice had CD45.2. He mixed them, he sacrificed them and mixed their bone marrow stem cells, and then used this to transplant a new mouse. And the idea was to see do these stem cells have the ability to make blood? This is like a gold standard experiment, which is done in vivo to see how functional the stem cells are. So, so you transplant a recipient mice with a mixture of stem cells from these mice, 
And then you look for the ratio of 45.1 and 45.2. So he saw something quite striking. So what we see is that after exposure to the vertebrate center dust, just one exposure, the amount of blood cells generated is much less than in the control transplant group. And this shows that even though the numbers of stem cells may not have changed drastically, but their functionality has gone down. And the reason we think this is happening is there have been a bunch of papers that the inflammation that is induced by the vertebrate center dust exposure makes the stem cells in the bone marrow functionally deficient. It exhausts them. It makes them prematurely aged. And we are now testing uh, the signs of premature aging by doing a bunch of molecular analysis on these stem cells. And you know, stay tuned for those results. Now, we also built another model uh, uh, to test the effect of the vertebrate center dust on clonal hematopoiesis. So as I had shown you, clonal hematopoiesis, the number two gene affected by this is a gene called TET2. So we took mice that had one allele of TET2 deleted. So trying to mimic the human TET2 clonal hematopoiesis and transplanted this in a wild type mice. And by transplanting this, we achieved a small clone. In one month's time, the amount of TET2 plus minus cells was 1.5%. And this clone grows over time. If you let it grow, it becomes slowly progressive. So it mimics human clonal hematopoiesis. So now we have a model, and now we can test whether exposure to the dust increases this or not. So, so we did that. This is uh, one representative sample. You can see vehicle, placebo exposure, TED took cells 10%, World Trade Center exposure increased the number of mutant cells. And these are the results synthesized together. You can see that the red, uh, uh, line is definitely more elevated compared to the, the, the black line. Okay, we've also done some uh, high resolution single cell analysis, trying to find what, what is the voltage center exposure doing to all these uh, uh, stem, progenitor, and blood cells. And we use a technology called single cell analysis. This is a technology which uh, allows us to look at the genes the expression of genes within each single cells. And the, the programs, the, the analytical programs based on the gene expression can divide cells into various types, erythrocytes, red cells, granulocytes, precursors, B cells, plasma cells, so on and so forth. And what we found that the mice that were exposed to the vertebrate center dust had, had a slight decrease in uh, red cells, actually slight increase, in, in erythroid precursors and white cells, and a slight decrease in some other cell types. Um, we, we are still in the process of doing more experiments and um, analyzing uh, these in, uh, with, with final results. But it does seem like this one exposure to vertebrate center does, does cause changes, not only in white cells, granulocytes, and neutrophils, but also in the cells that make immunoglobulins, plasma cells. So this is quite an interesting finding, which we hope to, to, to further test in future studies. Okay. We've also tried to see um, what's happening uh, in the serum of these mice. And, and one reason for this is that there is a lot of inflammation as shown by many, many talented investigators, some of these are on, some of whom are on the call, uh, that show that cytokine levels, inflammation levels of IL-1 beta, of, of various inflammatory cytokines are increased in first responder blood samples. So what we did was we exposed mice to the World Trade Center dust and looked for certain inflammation cytokines. And we found that they have elevated levels of this cytokine called IL-1 beta. IL-1 beta is a very, very strong stimulator of inflammation. And it binds to its receptor called IL-1 receptor 
but it also interestingly binds to a cofactor called IL-1 receptor accessory protein or IL-1 RAP. And what we see is that when we look at the TED2 mutant clones and expose these cells to the World Trade Center dust, we see an increased expression of this IL-1 RAP co-receptor. And very, very interestingly, these are preliminary experiments that have us very excited. When we expose TED2 negative cells to IL-1 beta, these cells expand. But when we delete genetically this IL-1 RAP molecule, they lose the ability to expand. So, so what this makes us think is that this may be a very nice target that we can manipulate and inhibit to prevent the growth of the mutant clones upon inflammatory exposure. And uh, we are gonna pursue studies uh, in the next few months testing this hypothesis. So, so to summarize this, this uh, I've told you that clonal hematopoiesis is a, a condition which is very prevalent as we age. And this is the presence of mutant clones in the blood. And various forms of inflammation can actually increase the growth of this mutant clones. Uh, we have shown exposure to vertebrate center dust, but various people have shown increasing age, smoking, chemotherapy, chronic infections, HIV infections can also increase the rates of clonal hematopoiesis. So, so this is something that we are seeing and hope to, to pursue further. Uh, the future plans, including sequencing all the samples that we have, um, correlating them with various clinical parameters, correlating them with signs of inflammation, but most importantly, once we have identified the cases that have these mutations, we will call them, we are in the process of sending letters to them to be examined in a comprehensive manner in clinics, you know, our clinic as well as other clinics. And what we will attempt to do is firstly to make sure they don't have early signs of leukemia, but also to do primary prevention for heart disease, strokes, lung diseases, and various inflammatory conditions. Uh, Dr. Aditi Shastri, who uh, should be on the call, is a national expert in clonal hematopoiesis. Uh, I'm lucky to have her as a colleague. And um, she and I will, will try and see the, the first responders that are referred to Montefiore and Einstein. Uh, so that's, that's all the data uh, that I wanted to present. Uh, I cannot thank NIOSH, CDC, and the World Trade Center program enough. Um, without your support, none of this is possible and none of this would have been done. Dr. Prezant, Rachel, uh, uh, David Gorfar, Charlie Hall, all the biostatisticians in, in the FDNY World Trade Center program. This, this is a true collaboration. Without them, none of this is possible. Dr. Savona, who contributed the controlled samples from Vanderbilt, Dr. Ola Landgren, who uh, helped us do the serum studies for myeloma, uh, Dr. Shastri, who's my colleague and a very outstanding hematologist, and people in my lab uh, who have contributed uh, for all the experiments that I've shown you. Dr. Divij Verma is an assistant professor who is doing all of these very elegant mouse studies, and Dr. R.C. Giritz, who was instrumental in building this bank. So with that, I am uh, thankful for the opportunity and happy to take any questions.